Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, after the class, or after the talk that we did, um, there are many questions that have been asked um, during the talk that I wasn't able to get to or uh, answer while in the midst of doing the talk. And there were some inboxes that I received um, pertaining to some of the statements that I have made. First and foremost, I want to clarify something. This, the issue of kufr, the issue of disbelief, or even takfir, saying someone is a believer or not a believer and removing someone from the fold of Islam, is a very, very, very touchy issue. The issue of tarqa salat, abandoning a salat, allowing a person to be a kafir, this is a very touchy, touchy issue. Because there are multiple scholars from both past and present who have dealt with these issues and they have difference of opinions in regards to um, the actual outcome of it. Sheikh Alabani was strongly of the opinion that a person who does not pray out of laziness or out of uh, negligence is not a kafir, but he is in the state of kufr. Um, Sheikh Fuzan, Sheikh Uthameen, they were of the opinion, based off the evidence that they have, as well as Sheikh Alabani had his own evidence, that they weren't, that a person who abandoned a prayer out of laziness and neglectfulness is a kafir. Um, however, as far as that ruling that to be placed on them will be placed on them from those people who can make that ruling, meaning Allah and His Messenger, and being the rulers of that time. Like we said, they mentioned Iman Shafi brought that the person should be executed if they are reminded and they are encouraged to repent from not praying and they get three days to do that. So it's a touchy, touchy issue. And as far as the Shahada, what people want to understand that the hadith of the Prophet where the man was on a battlefield and the companion still killed him after he said the Shahada. You have to understand something here. This companion was under the misconception or under the misconception that the person only said the Shahada because he was trying to save himself from being killed. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard of this, he became upset. And he said, how would you know that? How would you, did you split his heart open? Because how would you know why did he say the Shahada? And even if he did say the Shahada not to be killed, if he said at a time where he was being sincere, that is only with Allah. Allah will only know that. Now, in terms of have we seen this guy live and see him practice, because what we were talking about in the talk, you have to understand, is a Muslim, okay? What we were talking about is a Muslim. How does a Muslim behave? What is a Muslim? Do a Muslim does this? Is Shahada alone enough to say a person is a Muslim? The answer is no, unless, and I'm going to explain again, unless if Allah Jalla wa'ala, like in the case of the battlefield, was to take your soul after stating the Shahada, and you don't get a chance to carry out the other articans of Islam, you don't get a chance to practice Islam, but you take the Shahada, then in that case, then that's a case where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the person's soul before they can even practice Islam, but in that case, they're left, they're left with Allah. They're case is left up with Allah Jalla wa'ala. I cannot say that that person is a Muslim in that case because they have never got the chance or the opportunity to live to practice Islam. But according to what the material that we went over from Sheikh Salih Fuzan and from the proofs and evidence that he brought is that Islam has pillars and that they are erect upon those pillars and that Islam have a general definition and a specific definition and that for a person to be Muslim there are certain requirements that must be fulfilled in order for a person to be Muslims. And just having the Shahada alone is not sufficient enough. You have to have the Shahada alone with the other pillars. Okay, so that was the misconception that we wanted to clarify. Also, the misconception of homosexuality. We made the statement that homosexuality does not take you out of the fold of Islam. Okay, so the homosexuality, the issue of homosexuality, brothers and sisters, it is a heinous act. It is one of the most gravest and despicable acts. Ibn, Ibn al-Qayyim, he actually, and I was going to send, put the link up, he actually, Ibn al-Qayyim explains in one of his books about this issue at great length. And he brings the different positions of the ulama from the past, from amongst the sahabas, and also from the ulama of the past, dealing with how to punish them. Now, no one denied that it is a major sin, okay? They don't call homosexuals kufar, by the way. Where there's no reports that we have that the sahabas will call the people who practice homosexuality, Catholics, they would not call them, they would not take them out of Islam. They would say that they would have to repent from what they're doing and they have to be punished. The difference of opinion though, amongst them was how was the punishment
punished to be meted out. How was that punishment was to be meted out? There are some narrations said that they are to be taken to the highest mountains and thrown off. There are some uh, incidents that they are to be burnt because of certain um, HD had, like Ibn Abbas, like Ali ibn Abi Talib, that they said that it was only one nation that have committed this heinous act. And you see what Allah have done to them. So based off what Allah have done to them, they should get the same treatment. So there, then there are some scholars say no, they should be stoned to death like a zani because it's still a form of, a form of some type of um, fornication or adultery. So they should be treated like the zani. So there are three main views when dealing with homosexuality. But none of the views touch on the issue that the person who is a homosexual is a kafir. You understand? So the scholars does not tell us to say that they are a disbeliever because they commit the act. Unless they have explained to us, and this is with any act, it's not just with homosexuality, this is with any act, brothers and sisters, that is a major sin, or any act that is disobedience or haram. If a person does this act, then this person who believes that this act is permissible when Allah have deemed it, or his messenger have deemed it to be impermissible, then this is something that will take him out of the fold of Islam. Do you understand? This is one of those things that will invalidate his or her Islam. Because now you are making something that Allah has deemed impermissible, you're making it halal. And this is one of the rights of Allah, as Ibn Qayyim said, this is contending with Allah's rububiyyah. So Allah has verses in the Quran, and so it's said, Al-Nahl, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about the al-sinatihim, about those who were tasif for al-sinatihim, those who use their tongue, and they mention their tongue, and they say that this is halal and had al-haram. They say that this is permissible and this is impermissible. And Allah has not given them any authority to do so. Only Allah and His Messenger can tell us what is permissible and what is impermissible. So if a person is doing an act that is deemed impermissible by the deen, by Allah and His Messenger, and that person believes that that act itself is permissible when it's impermissible, then this takes a person out of Islam according to what the ulama have explained and Allah knows best. Another way that a person can be taken out of the of Islam, when we talk about naqit or those of nawaqit, um, is when a person is doing the act and he's persistent on the act after all of the evidence have been brought to him and have been told to him to stop and to cease doing these type of acts and the evidence has presented to him and he understand the evidence and then he continue to be persistent upon the evidence then in this case this individual is doing with his actions he is saying indirectly that this action is halal for him do you understand the issue now he is saying that it is permissible for him to do this act. Even after all of the evidence reached him, that he should repent, that he should cease, that he should leave it off, that it's not permissible, that Allah and his messenger have not sanctioned it, but he's still taking upon himself to still do it, then this individual is now saying indirectly with his actions that he deemed this thing to be permissible for him, and this is now contending with Allah's will be. So when we say something is that a homosexual does not homosexual does not take out a form of Islam. We stand by this. This is what the ulama have explained to us, and this is what the scholars, when they talk about this issue, they only talk about the difference of opinions, how they are to be punished. They do not talk about whether or not they are kufar. Okay, so I wanted to make that misconception clear, and also I think I clarified the misconception of the hadith of the person on the battle. Also, there was another question that a person asks: What if a person say shahada? and they don't know what it means, or they don't know what it entails. And that's another thing that you need to understand. That's why we explained this before, and I'm gonna explain it again. Um, Muhammad Wahab has a beautiful treatise that he was asking the question about explaining the statement of La ilaha illallah, okay? And in his treatise, he wrote like a little book, like a little small booklet. And he responded that the person who says La ilaha illallah, and he does not understand its meanings. He does not stay away from them things that invalidates it. He does not practice what is its requirements. He does not carry out its conditions. He does not carry out its pillars. Then this person in actuality isn't a Muslim. Do you understand? Because all of that is associated with it. You can't say la ilaha illallah and not know what it meant. You can't say la ilaha illallah and not study its conditions. You can't say la ilaha illallah without practicing its conditions. You can't say la ilaha illallah without studying its pillars. You can't say la ilaha illallah without staying away from those things that invalidates it. Because if you're saying la ilaha illallah and then you're going and worshiping something other than Allah, didn't you just invalidate the statement of la ilaha illallah? So didn't that wipe that out? So you have to be connived of it. Also, there are hadiths, our hadith from the Messenger of Allah that comes in Sahih Muslim. One of them is the Prophet said, man, 
من قال لا إله إلا الله وما سيز لا إله إلا الله دخل الجنة وانت بارادايس. شيخ صالح فوزان in his explanation to this tremendous book by Muhammad al-Wahhab, he explained to us that this narration needs to be understood by other narrations. Okay, and there's another narration where the Prophet Muhammad said, "Men, men, the Prophet Muhammad said." من قال لا إله إلا الله هو بس لا إله إلا الله ويكفر ما يؤبد من دون الله and he disbelieve in anything that is worship besides Allah. Now we see a sharp here. Now we see a condition here. So it explains the other narration. So you can't just say لا إله إلا الله and then you enter paradise. No, you have to say لا إله إلا الله with sincerity from your heart, as I say in another narration. You have to say لا إله إلا الله by disbelieving in everything that invalidates that لا إله إلا الله. Disbelieving in shirk. Disbelieving in kufr. It's believing in those things that are bid'ah. It's believing in those things that invalidates um, the shahada. And there are things that invalidate the shahada. You have to make sure you're aware of these things. That's why it's not okay to come into Islam with your shahada alone and think that you can just stop there. That's what we were trying to explain. It's a touchy issue. And I know people might say, well, brother, people say, we don't know what's in people's hearts. But like Umar ibn Khattab said, we are only responsible to judge by what's apparent. And to judge by what's apparent, the pillars of Islam are outward aspects. And a person actualizes what he or she says in their hearts by the actions of their limbs. That's how we know. You understand? And what a person says out of their mouths normally give you a taste or indication what's in their hearts. This is why it's not sufficient for a person to say that I believe in the law or I believe in Allah and you don't know what's in my heart. It's not sufficient to say that. Because you say you believe in Allah, your heart is going to what? Now your limbs is going to move you. Your limbs is going to move now and actualize what you say. Okay? So we don't have to be really confused. It's a touchy issue. And I knew when I went over it, I knew that some people will, you know, it would be offensive because, you know, you know a lot of people that, that are that are Muslim in name, you do. And you know a lot of people that we don't know everybody that's not making Salat. We're not, as Sheikh Bateme mentioned to us, we're not in everybody's home. We don't, we're not alone with everybody. We don't know when people make Salat by themselves or if they are making Salat by themselves. But we do know that there are certain things that deter an individual from doing certain things. And that's why we brought those narrations that a person that Salat, the Ayat, in the Salat, that Salat prevents you from certain things. So if you are praying, then you're not going to be behaving in a certain way. You understand? Sheikh Muhammad Imam, he comment on this ayat. He tells us in a khutbah that he says about this ayat, he says a person says to you, what about an individual who commits zina and he still prays? What about an individual who takes intoxicants but still prays? What about an individual who steals but still prays? The salat didn't prevent them. He said this is because you have to understand when it comes to salat, Allah Jalla tells us to ikama to salat. He tells us to establish the Salat, and he does not tell us to perform the Salat. And to establish the Salat comes with a lot of things. It comes with prerequisites, those things that come before the actual Salat. It comes with conditions, those things that are part of the Salat. It comes with pillars, the integral part of the Salat. It comes with wajibat, obligatory elements of the Salat. It comes with those things that null and void the actual prayer. It comes with all of these things, the sun elements. So when the ayah says, Inna salata tanha anil fahshayi wa munkar, it's talking about the salat that is established according to all of everything that it entails with it. When a person is doing that, then you're going to see the salat prevent him from carrying behavior in a certain way. Okay? We're not trying to pit nobody off of Islam. But what we're not trying to do is at the same time, we're not trying to overlook a key key element and that is when you accept shahada when you accept shahada you have to actualize that shahada okay that start off by learning what it means that started by studying it that started by implementing it and the way that you want to implement it is first and foremost you're going to pray that's another pillar of islam and then you're going to fast that's another pillar of islam then you're going to pay if it's, it's upon you to make hajj, I mean, um, to make uh, charity, and you have the necessary nasab, you're going to pay that. That's another pillar of Islam. Then you're going to do what else? You're going to make hajj if you have the ability to do so. Okay? Then you're going to do that once in your lifetime. That is another pillar of Islam. Then you have the arakan iman And this is very important that you understand that. The arakan iman are the inward aspects that deal with the call. Okay? And when a servant has the article iman, 
those six pillars, that servant is going to act and behave in a certain manner. You understand? They want to take the Shahada seriously. They want to take the prayer seriously because they know who they're praying to and they know what they're doing it for. That's what they want to do. They want to take these things differently. You can't do that if you don't know. So um, I don't want to put nobody off of the deen. And alhamdulillah, when I talk, sometimes I get emotionally. And you would, you would notice from multiple different people, when the Prophet would give a khutbah, they said he his face would become red and he, he would take on the appearance of a warner. Um, the Yemenis are very famous for this, the students of Sheikh Muqbil, or those who are familiar, who listen to their talks, especially their khutbahs and their classes, you will see that they are very fiery. Uh, Sheikh Ramadani um, as well, he's... He's fiery too. There are some other uh, Sheikh Sultan or Eid. There are a lot, of, a lot of other scholars from Saudi as well. When they speak, they get a little fiery. So I'm one of those guys that when I speak, I get a little fire up. That don't mean that I'm trying to throw something at you people, at, at the brothers and sisters. I'm trying to throw you off it. I'm not trying to be compassionate. That don't mean none of that, okay? I'm just trying to emphasize certain important things that we have to do and understand so that we can do things right. I hope I clarified a lot of the misconceptions that you had about the talk. And may Allah smile and forgive us again if we made any errors or, incor or incorrect statements within the talk that was not clear enough or that was wrong and outright wrong, okay? We do not pacify person Islam. I'm going to stick with this. Stop pacifying people Islam. We accept a person Islam on the outward aspects. As Umar ibn Khattab told us, we judge people by what's appearing. The Quran tells us to judge people. You understand? The Quran tells us to judge by the, the Quran tells us to judge by the criterion or by that was right and wrong from the injunctions of the Quran. The Sunnah tells us to judge people. Okay? This is a serious matter for me. And I know for you all because how many times or how many times we are going to different janazas right now? Let's stop being, we gotta stop lying to ourselves. How many times we are going to janazas of these young boys out here killing each other and each one of them saying that they were Muslim? How many? How many times we seeing somebody transgress against another person? How many? How many times we seeing somebody harm another person, but each of them saying they have shahada? How? Think about it. People are transgressing against each other. What is it? If, if Islam itself cannot prevent them from doing that to you, then what else? As Allah Jalla tells in the Quran, if, 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 after truth, what is it? After truth, what is it? It's after truth, is baltil. After truth, there's falsehood. If truth can't be the, the, the thing that's going to deter us, then what is it? We're not safe. Don't you understand that? So why you want to be around someone who's not taking Islam seriously? Who's not taking his or her Islam seriously? They're going to harm you at every turn. And then it, it touch home when you lose your son. Riyadhullah. Or you lose your daughter. Because females are getting shot now too. We just had a couple of reports. Females are getting murdered. So it, 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 do you understand? That takes your heart or getting hurt. It, it, it touches home though. When, it, when one of your loved ones is hurt by someone who is running around saying that they are Muslim. Do you understand? It, it, it touches. All, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, that's what we do. We, we, we remain and things like that. All of that is cool. But building a strong faith is going to still be based upon sticking to your tenets. Being a person of mild humbleness does not mean that you don't stand up for the haq. You will never find Umar ibn Khattab like that. You will never find Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Actually, actually Abu, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was the type that couldn't even lead a prayer without crying. He was so humble. He had a so humble heart. But guess what? When they wasn't going to pay that zakat, what did he do? When they stopped praying, what did he do? You know, everybody want to talk about a humble heart. Be just. Be kind. What did Abu Bakr al-Siddiq do when they did what they did? When the people stopped giving the zakat, what did he do? Tell me, when they stopped giving the zakat, what did he do? What was his stance? Was he humble and meek? Was he being kind? Was he saying this or that? No, he took a stance because he called for that. He took a stance that Umar himself, Ibn Khattab, he said himself, he said that oh, I saw that Abu Bakr as Sadiq have took a stance that no one else was taking a stance that I saw that he was actually correct in that stance. 
Because he knew that, as, as Abu Bakr said, if I don't care if we are a small band, if when the Messenger of Allah was, alive, was alive and he was giving the zakat and he was performing the prayer, it's the same thing I have to hold even when the Messenger of Allah was not alive. And actually what he did is he actually took a tremendous stance. That's what Islam allows us to do. You have to be able to take a stance. It don't go against nothing. It don't contradict nothing. It don't mean that you're not being kind. It doesn't mean that you're not being this and that. No, we're not, we're not turning to turn the other cheek. Where you get this concept from? Islam don't teach us that. I'm sorry. Islam do not spread. There's no ayat in the Quran that tells you to turn your other cheek. That, that, that dawah is watered down. I don't know where you get that from. Yes, it tells us to have good character. It tells us to have the good manners and all that. But it don't tell us to turn the other cheek. Never. It tells us that if something happened to us, then that we only extend that revenge to the blow that was sent to us. And that we defend ourselves. But that it is better that we pardon and that is more that, that we have patience with the matter. That's what it tells us in our book and the Quran. You understand? Not the one that you just put on your shelf. I'm talking about the one you're actually reading. In Surah Tashura, Allah tells us that. Not to turn out the cheek, but you can you can return the blow that you receive from an individual. You can protect and defend yourself. You don't have to turn your other cheek. We got to stop, stop this meekness stuff, man. Except in everything. We have become so watered down in our understanding of the dollar. This is why it's a problem. Everything is sensitive. So when you talk about kufr, so when you, I mean, that's a touchy issue. So when you talk about different things that you have to talk about and you have to stand up for or make a stance for, everybody getting sensitive. Like the LGBT, the LGBT community. community. You have Muslims, don't you know You know they're saying over about 40% of Muslims, I just read this, over 40% of Muslims are now being sympathetic to the LGBT community? You don't see what watering your dawah does? You don't see that? If Allah hate that, how are you going to come along and make it and be sympathetic to us? Do that even make any sense? Allah destroyed the people as Ibn Al-Qayyim explained, in the most horrendous way. He never destroyed any other town like this. It was the first time the act ever done. So how you now want to come alone and be sympathetic and then tell other Muslims, be nice. Love is the way. What are you talking about? Love for Allah and hating for Allah is the way. <laughs> love is not the way. Love for Allah and hate for Allah is the way. You understand? Carrying out your actions for Allah and staying away from those things that Allah, that's the way. The Prophet was the most kind-hearted person on this earth. He was the most merciful to the creation. The Prophet himself, brothers and sisters, there's no one on the face of this earth, I don't care who you find, and in the time that the Prophet walked this earth, that is more loving, that is more caring, that is more compassionate, that is more merciful, that is more understanding, that have best akhlaq, moral mannerism. You won't find no one better than the Prophet on this earth. And if you believe that there is, then something is wrong with your Islam. And that, too, can take you out of fold of Islam, since we want to talk about things that can actually you out of fold of Islam. One of the things that Muhammad Wahab brings in his Nawakul to Islam is that anyone that believes that there is a guidance better than the guidance of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or believe that there is a legislation better than the legislation that which Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with, then that person have exited the fold of Islam. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I'm not just speaking out of my mouth or speaking out of terms here. I'm telling you that the Prophet is the best person on this earth that ever walked this earth. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And if he's the best person that ever walked this earth, then we have to emulate him as Allah commanded us to do so. And he took stances and he became upset when Allah's deen was being violated. And that's how we supposed to be, inshallah ta'ala. I know there are other individuals out there that um, may not be Muslim. So... Um, again, like I said, when I used to be on Periscope, there would be people who would say stuff and, you know, things like that. But we're not talking about that. I just want to clarify the misconception. I that, hope that they clarify. Brothers and sisters, kufr, tech fear, and all that stuff is tashi issues. Do not go around placing rulers on nobody. I hope you didn't get from my talk that I gave that I was placing any rulers on nobody. I did answer a question for you that it's not possible that a person can just stop at a shahada. You have to carry out all five pillars and the uh, other, other cans of iman. Yes, I put my proof for that. And it's not possible that a person could say that they're that um it's not possible that a person can say that they're Muslim and they're not praying. I brought you my proof of that as well. And you're not actually agreement upon upon sahabas that a person who does not pray is not Muslim. Um, you know, and it's different of opinion over the other acts of the Artakan, but the prayer for sure 
they all agree that a person who leaves out the prayer is not Muslim. Whatever he said that was incorrect in his clarification, it's for myself, in front of Shaitan, whatever he said that was correct, it's for Allah, Jalla Allah, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, Alhamdulillah, Ashadu Allah, Astaghfirullah, Atubu Ilayhi.